grace and mercy and peace to you from him who was, who is to come. Again, Jesus Christ, the Alpha and Omega. Amen. We turn our attention once again to our reading from the book of Revelation, where now for the third time, we're taking special time to look at the book of comfort that was revealed to the elderly St. John that afternoon on the Isle of Patmos. Living in persecution, Christians may have felt at times as sheep being led to the slaughter. But Jesus, the good shepherd, is also the Lamb of God who wanted to reassure them that he will always guide us to, through safe pastures and successfully lead us to our eternal home. And as he leads us, there are, in fact, dangers. We do pass through the valley of the shadow of death. There are enemies before which he prepares us a table. There are wolves who are out to get us, and the devil prowls around as a roaring lion, seeking a sheep to devour. And then the devil uses those many problems, temptations, trials, tribulations around us to plant this idea in our head that maybe doesn't God doesn't care, maybe our shepherd isn't so good. Is there in fact really a good shepherd? And if he can get us to abandon the flock and abandon the shepherd, then he has us. What a dangerous mistake that would be. Abandon the only one who could protect us? The only one who can take us home? Today in our reading from Revelation, we get another glimpse at that home that our good shepherd is seeking to lead us to. He wants us with him in everlasting glory. When we're there, we too will be before the throne of God and serve him day and night in his temple. All because the Lamb of God is our good shepherd. As he previewed the heavenly worship that Jesus showed him, John asked about the great multitude that was before him. Who are they? Where did they come from? And Jesus himself answered him, these are the ones who are coming out of the great tribulation. And we need to stop and think about that term, great tribulation. TV preachers point to to that as something that hasn't happened yet. Obviously, they don't pay attention to the news. Jesus is being honest and reminding us that this life, especially for us Christians, is a great tribulation. For many Christians, it is truly great because of persecution. But even if your life is somewhat trouble-free, as we fairly well-to-do middle-class American Christians have it right now, it still qualifies as a great tribulation. It's not even worth comparing with the glory that will be revealed in us, as Paul says in Romans chapter 8. What makes it a great tribulation? Well, first of all, the corrupted creation causes tribulation for Christians. Hardly all Christians are well fed and happy. Very few Christians live in times of prosperity and peace. Think through the history of the church that Jesus describes in the book of Revelation. Think of the millions and millions of Christians who were dropping like flies during the time of the Black Death, for example. Think of the many Christian families who suffered from polio and tuberculosis just a, de a generation ago. 
Think of the many Christians around the world who today are suffering from poverty and drought and famine. These are the ones, Jesus says, coming out of the great tribulation into heaven. There, and this is why he mentions these things, there they will never be hungry or thirsty ever again. The sun will not beat upon them, nor any scorching heat. Or think of the sadness that every Christian, including us, suffer whenever we have to face the fact that all of us are mortal and we lose loved ones. These are those who are coming out of the great tribulation and God will wipe away every tear from their eyes. More specifically, think of the many hardships that Christians suffer as a result of their clear confession of faith in Christ. Beginning with Stephen in Jerusalem and then through 11 of the apostles, how many Countless and, unlike the apostles, nameless Christians were killed by the time Jesus revealed this scene to John in around 95 AD. And how many have died since 95 AD? You think it was easy for missionaries bringing the gospel to barbarian tribes in Europe? Hardly. Or the many missionaries and Christians who were killed in Asia and bringing the gospel there. And now we're living in a present where once again these things are becoming normal in the headlines. Christians being wiped out in the Middle East, in Northern Africa, Eastern Africa, Western Africa. Not to mention Christians being bombed in Easter worship in Sri Lanka, in the Pacific. In his great Hall of Faith chapter, Hebrews chapter 11, the author lists so many of the Old Testament martyrs. Some were tortured and refused to be released. Some faced jeers and flogging, while still others were chained and put in prison. They were stoned. They were sawed in two. They went about in sheepskins and goatskins, destitute, persecuted, and mistreated, wandered in deserts and mountains and in caves and holes in the ground, these are the ones who are coming out of the great tribulation. We just happen to have lived in one of the rarest times in all world history, we modern American Christians. And it's frankly tended to make us kind of wimpy. As we see pressure build on us to compromise and even abandon our faith, we're really just getting back to the, the old normal, the way things have been throughout the church's history. But we're tempted to avoid the worst of it by keeping quiet about our faith. We're not saying anything about the great blatant moral issues of our day. No doubt the early Christians threatened with death were also tempted to, to keep quiet about their faith. And so Jesus revealed this scene to remind us what awaits those who are faithful and remain faithful, even in the face of death. You know, the most popular confirmation verse of all time is... Be faithful unto death, and I will give you the crown of life. Listen to it in its context in the book of Revelation. Do not be afraid of what you are about to suffer. I tell you, the devil will put some of you in prison or test you, and you will suffer persecution for ten days. Be faithful unto death, and I will give you the crown of life. You see, we who remain faithful will be part of the number that John saw. These, you, are those who are coming out of the great tribulation. The steady drumbeat of news stories about 
Christians in our country being boycotted or being sued or being maligned by the press or on TV makes us as Christians feel like a, an ever-shrinking minority, maybe even a really small flock of believers. And the flock may be small at various places and times, and so God gave John intentionally the big picture. I looked, and there was a great multitude that no one could count from every nation, tribe, people, and language standing in front of the throne and of the Lamb. So how many people will God preserve through the trials and sufferings and temptations and persecutions that are described here with that term, great tribulation? Well, John couldn't count them. And how many today is God preserving for himself in eternity? Well, we can't count them either. But of this we can be assured, all those who trust in Jesus' payment for our sins on the cross, who trust in the blood that Jesus shed as the sacrifice for all sins and the basis, the entire basis of salvation, are definitely going to be part of that crowd standing before God's throne. These are the ones coming out of the great tribulation who? The ones who have washed their robes and made them white in the blood of the Lamb. Compared to the thoughtless thousands who choose the road that leads the soul away from God, as the hymn writer put it, God's elect are indeed a small flock, relatively speaking. But they come from every nation and tribe and people and language and from all of the centuries of the age of the church, from the time Christ ascended into heaven until the time he returns on judgment day. Wherever the gospel is preached and people trust in Jesus as their Savior and persevere in the faith, they will join God's people in glory. Those who are there will be those who fell down at the feet of Jesus, like the woman who washed Jesus' feet with her tears and then dried them with her hair. Those who get to heaven will be like the man in the temple who beat his breast and looked down and said, Lord, have mercy on me, a sinner. Those who will be there in the countless multitude are those who trusted in the cleansing blood of Jesus entirely for forgiveness and eternal life. These are the ones coming out of the great tribulation. They have washed their robes and made them white in the blood of the Lamb. Which is why we make such a point of joining them and crying out, Lord, have mercy on me, a sinner. That's why we sing, O Christ, Lamb of God, you take away the sin of the world, have mercy upon us. O Christ, Lamb of God, you take away the sin of the world, grant us your peace. That's why we come up together to the Lord's table so that he can give us the medicine of eternal life as he pours out his shed blood for each of us and again washes our sins away. And that's why and how we fit into the vision that John saw that Sunday afternoon on Patmos. Our good shepherd watches over us every day. We just can't always see it. But one day we will see what has been true all along. We'll be able to see it clearly because there won't be any tears in heaven. They are in front of the throne of God and they serve him day and night in his temple. He who sits on the throne will spread his tent over them 
They will never be hungry or thirsty ever again. The sun will never beat upon them, nor will any scorching heat. For the Lamb at the center of the throne will be their shepherd. He will lead them to springs of living water, and God will wipe away every tear from their eyes. Week after week, we want to serve our Savior, but we fall short even by our own standards, not to mention God's expectation of perfection. We leave the sanctuary after worship, eager to serve our Lord, and sometimes we don't even get out of the building before we've started an argument. By Tuesday, the devil has already totally made fools of us once again. Week after week, our good and perfect shepherd leads us to paths of righteousness for his namesake. Sunday after Sunday, our good shepherd feeds us on the pure pastures of his word and gives us to drink of the water of life, the good news of sins forgiven and life restored. And yet week after week, we once again demonstrate that we love to stray as sheep. We love to wander. And sometimes we even follow the group of sheep heading for the cliff. And yet, week after week, the loving shepherd who is the lamb calls out our names and calls us back to his side. How patient and merciful he is. And the more you see yourself as the dumb sheep that you are, the more you will marvel at the long-suffering grace and mercy of the Lamb at the center of the throne who is your shepherd. But in heaven, we won't be so dumb anymore. Our sinful nature will be removed. We will rise with glorified bodies, but not only glorified bodies, not only will our limitations and our ailments be gone, it means that we will never ever desire what is harmful. We'll never again wander away. Our desires will never be different than what God desires for us. There will never be There we will never be hungry or thirsty ever again. The sun will not beat upon us, nor will any scorching heat. For the lamb at the center of the throne will be our shepherd. He will lead us to springs of living water, and God will wipe away every tear from our eyes. The day, that day, is coming. See the tribulation for what it is. It was foretold, and God will bring us through it. Satan's rage and fury are at work because he knows his time is short. But at the same time, Christ, the Lamb, is your good shepherd. He will bring you safely there. Never stop listening to your Savior's voice his encouragement, his comfort, and his directions, and you will step right into John's vision. They'll put that white robe on you. You will have palm branches in your hands. You'll be there in that worship. Just keep listening to your shepherd's voice. Amen.